And don't forget to put it in presentation mode. Okay. Just gonna wait. Welcome. I'm just going to wait a few minutes and let everyone join. But thank you so much for joining us this evening. Yeah, welcome to everyone that's, that's joining us this evening. Thank you so much. And um, we're just going to give it just another minute just to make sure that everyone has joined and they don't miss the start. Okay. Um, okay, I think I'll start to kick it off. So um, welcome everyone to um, this evening's webinar on egg freezing with Dr. Adiola. Um, my name is Aoife Bradson and I'm the Communications and Marketing Manager for Sims IVF. Um, just a, a tiny bit about Sims IVF. So we are part of Virtus Health, which is actually a global provider of fertility treatments. We have a great network of support around us. We also have um, clinics in kind of throughout Ireland. So we have our three main clinics, which are in Clonsky in South Dublin, We've, where our next clinic is in Swords um, in North Dublin. And then we have our clinic down in Cork, but we also have satellite clinics. So what I mean by satellite clinics is that we have clinics that we can provide testing, like blood testing and um, ultrasound scans during your cycle. So we have them um, one in Dundalk, one in Carlo, and one in Nimerick as well. Um, so just a little bit about tonight, and um, if you have any questions at all, um, we welcome them, so just pop them into the Q&A box. Um, if there's anything that I can answer, I will throughout the evening, but um, if not, um, myself and Dr. Adiella will go through them at the end. And um, yeah, so just pop them in there, and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Adiola. Hello everyone, um, my name is Ariola. I'm one of the doctors from SIMS and working from the SIMS IVF SWATS. Um, today we're going to be talking about all things about egg freeze and um, like Aoife suggested, if you have any questions you can just pop it into the queue in here and then we will go through everything today. So So a little bit about myself, um, I graduated from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland in 20, 2006, and I've worked in area of obstetrics and gynecology since about 2009, and before I moved to area of infertility then um, about five, six years ago. Um, what we'll be doing today is we will be going over the female biology first, We'll look at some of the indications where we may want to consider egg freeze, some investigations that may be necessary, a little bit of overview of what an egg freeze cycle entails, and then we we'll just look at a little small data, just looking at success rate in terms of when we should be considering considering egg freeze and what is the success rate like at that stage. So the biggest factor is our uh, women, we are born with the total number of eggs we have. And the peak amount of eggs we have is actually about when we're 20 weeks gestation in inside mommy's belly. And by birth, that kind of number is dropped down to about 1 million. And by the time we reach puberty, it varies depending on the literature, but it will be somewhere between 250 to 400,000, so about 300,000. And by the time we reach, um, you know, at twenties to thirties, which is kind of what we consider optimal time for fertility, we're down to about 120 million eggs. And by the time we reach about 37, and which is actually the age on average that we consider fertility to decline, although a lot of people talk about 40, but it seems the biggest decline is actually between 37 and maybe about 38. And at that stage, we have about 25,000. And by the time then we reach menopause, which the average age will vary depending on the 
society or where you're growing up in, but generally between the age of about 49 to 52, we usually have less than a thousand at that stage. Um, generally, when we're in when we're inside mommy belly, our eggs have 46 sets of chromosomes. And what will happen is that by the time we we're born up to before puberty, they are at a stage where they've had their first division. And we usually call that stage the first meiotic division. And that's the time that it's frozen. And it's not until we reach puberty itself that the second stage of the division starts, starts. And that second stage of it starting is dependent on an hormone called follicle stimulating hormone or FSH. But what happens is that once that, that second stage of division start, then we will usually be able to have 23 sets of chromosome that is ready to be fertilized with sperm and we release those every month. So in the regular menstrual cycle, what usually will happen is that you have a slight rise in the hormone of called FSH, the follicle stimulating hormone. And around day five, day six, this level of the hormone dipped a little bit and you will select what would become your dominant follicle that month. And what usually will happen then is that as the follicles are developing, the estrogen levels goes up and the lining start thickening. And then eventually just before ovulation, and that's really depending on the high level of estrogen that we produce, that will stimulate the body to produce LH and which we call luteinizing hormone, that induces ovulation. After ovulation, then the progesterone levels start growing up, although a little bit also before ovulation, but mainly after ovulation. And that hormone is basically produced by what is left over after ovulation, which is the corpus. And the progesterone then is what makes the lining more spongy, more ready to accept the embryo. And if pregnancy does not occur in that cycle, the corpus, which is what is left after ovulation or sometimes called corpus luteum as well, we eventually break down and die off. And that means the all, both the estrogen and the progesterone level will drop and we start a menstrual cycle all over again. A lot of people actually usually think that you produce one follicle every month, but actually contract due to that, that's not true. You actually have quite a few follicles trying to develop every month. And what happens is that as those follicles develop, some of them will die off. And generally that kind of happens more commonly from around day five, day six of the cycle. And eventually we select one. So not only is the number of the eggs that we're producing reduces every as we get older, but also in terms of the number of follicles that is growing every month, we're also losing eggs. And so regardless of what we do, we're going to eventually lose the number of eggs that we have in storage. But that process continues, happens continuously, even in the regular cycle on a monthly basis. So for us, biological clock is for both men and women, to be honest, but it's definitely more an issue with us women because of the fact that we are born with the total number of eggs they have. So it's generally said that when we're in about 20 to 25, when we're the most fertile, by the time we reach 35, we are half as fertile as we are in our 20s. By the time we're 40, it's less than what it was at 35. And by the time we're 46, it's potentially we have very little or no like eggs left then um, to use really. And I'm just sharing the screen with, just to give an idea. We don't need to take off all the information there. But I wanted to point how these uh, lines holding as chromosomes together, they're called the spindles. And this is really the biggest factor that we think that as we get older, abnormal division of our eggs are more likely. Because the spindles fibers are stretched and you know, they're pronounced, the older those fibers are, the more likely they're weaker and the more likely that you're going, we're prone to having abnormal fertilization or abnormal eggs as we get older. So looking at the statistics that we have, we do know that no matter what we do, a couple of our eggs are going to be abnormal and a couple of our eggs are going to be normal. But 
when we're about 25 to 30, they say about 66% of our eggs are what we call genetically normal eggs. About 14% will be um, abnormal and about 20%, we have some degree of abnormality, but not a lot. But by the time we get to 43 the, or greater than 43, the reverse of that happens. And about 78% of our eggs are abnormal, 12% are considered normal, and nine may have a little bit of some degree of abnormality and some degree of normal as well. So when we're looking at egg freeze, there are different indications that we may need to consider in terms of why do we want to freeze it. And the biggest factor is actually cancer diagnosis. So being, you know, having to have exposure to chemotherapeutic agents, this is where the egg freeze actually started is can we preserve fertility of people that we know that they might be exposed with agents that will make them infertile or may make them infertile, I should say. And then in the last couple of years, people have been freezing and for social reason, as we're delaying fertility, um, having more career options, um, we're seeing that. And there are other reasons medically we may want to consider it. There's a lot proponing maybe endometriosis, Patient diagnosed with endometriosis should proceed to have egg freeze before they start having surgery. Again, that's a debate that needs to be addressed, but there are places in the world that is being done now uh, just for that. Um, family history of premature ovarian failure or one of the BRCA gene, particularly BRCA1, where the ovaries might be affected and the person may need to have their ovaries remote and their early stage. And there are other medical indications also that we may want to consider, but those would be the most common reason to consider freezing eggs. So investigations is actually very simple for, in terms of when we're freezing eggs. Generally, we want to look at the thyroid function test. We want to look at the big factor, which is the one everybody talk about, the AMH test. And we want to look at the hormones that control the first part of the cycle which is the FSH, the LH, and the estrogen level. And generally, that's the main test we need to do when we're looking at the ovary reserve in terms of blood tests. Now, there might be other tests that may be indicated because of a medical history, but as a basic, those will be the tests that we'll be doing. And we also combine that with a transvaginal ultrasound scan. We are assessing the ovary. We are looking at the number of follicles on the ovary. And on the slide, then you can see picture of follicles in the ovary on ultrasound scan. But we also make, want to make sure that we are going to be able to access or reach the ovary at the time of the air collection, that there's no fibroid in the way, there's nothing else that we think may be. So it's a general assessment of mainly the ovary, but we also assess the womb at the same time as well. So the AMH test, um, which a lot of people talk about, is the anti-mullerian hormones that are produced by tiny, tiny follicles that have actually not been ovulated yet. So they are not at the time where they're ovulating. They're not at this time they're being stimulated. But what this is telling us is what is the likelihood of you falling into a reserve compared to other people your age? So for most people, they will fall between that 25 to 75% center. When you're less than the 25% center is considered as um, low reserve, and that is the red graph. And then somebody with higher reserve over 75, where might be maybe patient with polycystic ovary, that's considered higher reserve. But no matter where you fit in in the graph, as we get older, the reserve we go lower, and that's just what this is showing to us in the graph. In that, so again, normal reserve, uh, low reserve, or what we call diminished ovarian reserve, and then higher reserve. Sometimes in polycystic ovary, but some people can have higher reserve because genetically they have higher reserve without having polycystic ovarian syndrome or polycystic ovary. So. In terms of um, what this means, it's just telling us the probability that you're likely to respond to the medication and what are the realistically the amount of eggs are we likely to get if we stimulate you. It is not a test of egg quality. 
Unfortunately, there is no test for egg quality. The only test for egg quality is actually having a baby with those eggs. So as a result of it, there's a limitation to egg reserve test in the sense that doing a yearly egg reserve test wouldn't really tell us what are the chances that you will have a live birth or you're going to have a baby in a year or two, but it will give us an idea whether how likely you are going to respond to the medications that will be given because the lower the reserve, the less likely you respond to the med medication and generally the less likely the number of eggs that we get from that cycle. So if we are looking at egg freeze, um, it's generally simple basic. Um, when we're doing an, an egg free cycle, we generally want it to be of the contraceptive pill, which is the combined contraceptive pill for generally about two months. Because when we're doing the AMH test or what we call the egg reserve test, when you're on the pill, you get a first lower result um, or especially if you've been on the pill for a long time, because when you're on the contraceptive pill, you're not regularly ovulating, it gives a false result like your egg reserve is low. So when we never we want to look at egg reserve and you're considering egg freeze, if you've been on contraceptive pill and that's combined contraceptive pill a while, we usually recommend stopping that. But in terms of stimulation of egg freeze, the process itself, generally does not take more than two weeks, two and a half weeks. We may ha have a pre-treatment, pre in which case we may put you on a contraceptive pill, or we may put you on a combination on estrogen or femotab, or we may put you on estrogen and progesterone, I should say, or we may put you on just progesterone only. The period of pre-treatment, it usually does not take more than one to three weeks before starting. And not everybody will necessarily need a pre-treatment. But once the stimulation process starts, which usually start with generally either a combination of FSH, which is a follicle stimulation or stimulating hormone, or the luteinizing hormone, whether it's one or the other or combination of both, that stimulation process usually starts in the first few days of the cycle. Then in these injections are given in the tummy or in the thigh area, very similar to being diabetic and having insulin injection every day. And you will be on those injections every day, generally at the same time of the day. Um, so for, for in our clinic, for most patients, it will be about on average, say 6 to 9 p.m. every day in the evening, you take your injection around the same time or give or take. Injections then are given every day, and then around anywhere between day five to day eight of the cycle, we usually start a second medication or a third medication if you've been on the two, if you've been on two already, um, to prevent ovulation. So you'll be on two stimulation injection and then one to prevent ovulation. And after about a week, you start coming for ultrasound scan for monitoring. And that is just to monitor the growth of the follicles that are available to us that month. The scans generally are every two to three days. And like I said, on average, stimulation doesn't take more than 10 to 14 days. And once you're ready, you stop all the injections you've been taking, we trigger, and then we do the air collection around on average 35 and a half hours to about 36 and a half hours after you take your trigger. In this slide, it's mentioning HCG at the trigger. Nowadays, we do not use HCG. We tend to use a different medication, and that's to reduce the risk of a complication called ovarian hyperstimulation. I won't go too much into that, but essentially what the process of going to egg freeze and egg collection retrieval takes about two to two and a half weeks. And that's usually the same number of time it takes in the natural cycle to get to ovulation as well. So for the egg retriever, the process is usually done on the, general, uh, on the sedation. And it's with the sedation, it's like um, the similar medication to if you were going to have dental procedure done or some biopsy procedure done. Um, so you will be on the sedation, 
It's all done transvaginally, just like the scan. A needle goes to the lateral vaginal wall into what we call an area called the phonix, and it goes into the follicle. And then we start draining those fluid that we can see. So what happens is that the, the eggs are microscopic. We can't see the eggs with physical eyes, but when you're scanning, we can see the follicle developing. And that's what we're seeing at the time that we're doing ultrasound. And that's what we're seeing at the time of egg collection. So the, the, the fluid then is then drained into a test tube and handed to the embryologist. And the embryologist start looking on the microscope for eggs. Generally on the microscope, they look similar to this. They're really, really pretty boring compared to embryos. And the whole idea then is to be able to see how many number of eggs that you get in that cycle. Everybody will be different. The generally, the higher the reserve, the likely the more eggs that you have within a cycle, but it will kind of be more individualized as you go along within the cycle. But with any one of this, the ideal number of eggs we want to be getting is about eight to 15. If we get more than that, that's fine, but also we prefer to, also if it's less than that, that's also okay, depending on the reserve, but the average is about eight to 15 eggs per cycle. Once the eggs are then collected, later in the afternoon, they're going to be checked for maturity by the embryologist, and the eggs that are mature are what they will be freezing, and the eggs that are immature at that stage will be discarded, and usually you will have a consultation with your doctor or at least a summary of plan afterwards saying, okay, this is how many we get. Should we look at maybe doing more cycles to get more numbers of eggs and things like that. In terms of recovery, um, generally with the trigger medication we use to trigger ovulation, for most people we get their bleed within five to seven days of egg collection, signaling that the hormone levels have dropped back down to normal, that everything then is returning back to normal after the egg collection process. So one of the biggest factor people always ask is, oh, does it work? You know, one doc, you know, there are some doctors that say it doesn't work. There are some doctors that say it works. So I'm going to just go over and review, um, you know, a couple, just two literatures. That one of them is a European study. Um, the other one is a North American study in USA. Just looking at the success rate in terms of egg freeze, and then what are the statistics behind it? And at what time is the best time we should be doing this? And what is the average number of eggs that we should be considering having in storage, in storage to give a good chance of success? So this study was actually published, I believe, 2000 and, uh, 2016. But it looked at looking at egg freeze for cycles between 2012 and 2015. And if anybody wants to kind of, you know, do research or do a lot more um, studies at the end or on egg freeze, um, this person, Anna Kobo, um, is a doctorate of science, has a lot of studies, a lot of research to back recommendation of egg freeze up. Um, so, so, First, this cycle that I'm going to talk about, it's not the one with endometriosis. This is just looking at freezing in patients that want to freeze their eggs socially because they are not ready to start their embryo and those that do not have any other medical condition that cancer. So if you have endometriosis, if you have other medical conditions where you want to consider freeze your eggs or you're planning a surgery, that there's concern that they might have to remove one or two of the ovaries, then this way the groups of patients in this. So this does not include cancer patients. So this will be most people that come in for egg freeze generally for social reasons or for medical reasons. And they look at over 1,468 egg freeze cycles, but just to let you know that only 137 returned in those time period between 2012 and 2015, although the eggs were frozen as far back as 20, uh, 2007, 
only 135, 37 return to use their eggs. And to me, that's not bad because it also may mean that people are still able to have a chance of conceiving naturally. But they divided the patients into two groups. There were some looking at social egg freezing and the average age in those groups was 37.7. And those with medical indication for the egg freeze, the average age was about 35.7 years. So this is translating to me that we all need to do a lot of work into looking at doing treatment when we're looking at freezing our eggs for social reason at an earlier stage than you know, the average people will be. And they also look at the success rates in this group. Generally, there wasn't much difference in success rate, whether it was for medical condition or, or, or whether they were freezing socially. But what they find is that the success rate per patient, so if you pick patient that transferred and they're 35 years or less, the success rate was 50%. When the pick patient that was 36 or more years old, the success rate was 22.9%. So again, emphasizing that the success rate is much higher if we're freezing at 35 years or less. They then look at the cumulative life birth rate. So this is, we use all the eggs we have in that storage. We get as many embryos as they want and we start putting that back. And this may be more than one transfer, but all the eggs in that cycle, it's used to form embryo and we continue to put it back until we have a baby. And they found that when you have five eggs, and this is for women 35 years or less, the success rate was 15.4%. When you have eight eggs, the success rate was 40.8%. Again, also pointing into some of the things we knew from IVF that the average number of eggs for success is about eight to 15. Now, they did find that in the younger women, the more eggs you get, the higher the success rate. So you're increasing the success rate at eight to 4%, almost 10% per egg. Again, emphasizing that trying to get to that number will be good. Now, what they said in this study, though, is that once you start reaching that closer to 15 eggs, it doesn't, between 10 to 15 eggs, the success rate doesn't seem to be that big increase depending on the number of eggs. Now, what they find is that once they can get up to 15 eggs, they could actually get a live birth rate using all those eggs to reach about 85.2% of women. So basically, the more the eggs we have, of course, the higher the chance. And again, emphasizing that on average, you want to be getting close to that 15 eggs for women under 35. Now, when you get to the 36 or more, the studies found that when you have five eggs, the success rate was 5.1%. But that also increases significantly when we get to age to 19.9%. But they find out that it doesn't seem to increase much more compared to the younger age. And what they notice is that when you get to that maximum of 10 to 15 eggs, the life birth rate was still about 35.6, nowhere near what we were. So the recommendation based on the studies will be to consider egg freeze definitely at 35 or less. There's still evidence for success rate over that age and the biggest, biggest, um, over that age and the biggest factor seems to be age, but also, especially in younger women, getting more eggs might also give us a higher chance of live birth rate and that's baby. Now, this is even a newer publication. This was published October last year. Um, and this is a US uh, publication. This cycle contained over 6,000 embryo transfers from frozen eggs. And in fact, I would say compared to the European studies, very, very little data on freezing eggs over 
40 in Europe because it's generally not a practice. Um, in most part um, of, you know, Germany, France, Spain, uh, places like that, people tend to have treatment uh, at a younger age than they will do in Ireland. So very, very difficult to get a lot of data with egg freeze. Um, over 40. And this is probably one of the only study where I could get a decent data in women over 40. But uh, this study looks at uh, cycles that had transfers between 2014 and 2018, but those eggs were frozen as far as back as 2012. And in this study, they that clinic usually generally don't to more than 10 to 11 eggs. So when I'm talking about the cycle in terms of success rate in this first data, it's looking at success rate pertain to, you know, 10 to 11 eggs. Um, that's their policy. But what they found out that in the women that were 42 or more, the average number of eggs that they were touring was six. So I'm assuming they didn't get more than that. And the age is not the age at the time of transfer. This is the age of the women at the time that they had those eggs frozen. And what they found is that the pregnancy rate per tour cycles, and again, these are embryos that were not genetically tested. This is embryos that were just put back on day five or day six, what we call blastocyst stage. And what they found is that the pregnancy rate per tour cycle was 41.4 at less than 35. That's if we free, if we taught 10 to 11 eggs on average. If you're between 35 to 37, 36.9. If you're between 38 and 40, 24.3. And at 41 to 42, 15.2. And by the time they get to 42, it was only about 2%. The live birth rate also was 35.3, which is having a baby. 29.9, 35 to 39, 37. At 38 to 40, it was 16.9. And 9.5, it was 1.0. Again, the life birth rate being very low. This is looking at, again, I said 10 to 11 oocytes being tall per cycle. If we then look at the data that they have tall all the oocytes, they had multiple embryo transfer it then makes sense that the success rate will be higher. But what they found is that the pregnancy rate per transfer of the embryo, so if we put one embryo back and you're less than 35 and we tore all the eggs that we got frozen, you have about 49.8% chance of pregnancy rate and 42.8% chance of a live birth rate. This is not too different from also doing a fresh cycle. When you look at 35 to 37, it's 46.4. And then when we look at live birth rate, at then is 37.6. So the miscarriage rate seems to be a little bit higher when you're looking at 35 to 37 than less than 35. And when you get to 38 to 40, 33.6 was the pregnancy rate. And again, live birth rate 22.9. But these studies were still able to show that even after 40, they were able to get some live birth rate and also pregnancy rate with egg freeze. However, they did say that in order to achieve this number, you may be looking at having up to 50 eggs frozen. So first of all, the success rate when we're over 40 is lower. The amount of eggs we tend to have at that stage as well is lower, and the number of embryos that we get from the cycle are lower. So the reality of being able to have up to 50 eggs frozen, it's not very realistic for most people. And they did mention that the average number of eggs, if you're less than 35, that 15 should be about enough. Again, very similar to the previous study from Anacobo suggesting that once you get to about 15 eggs, you're not really necessarily, and that's the 35 or less, you're not necessarily increasing the numbers of success rate when we're looking um, at egg freeze. So that kind of brings me to the conclusion 
and just saying that if we are considering a freeze at any point in time, the ideal age will be 35 or less. It may still be worth considering freezing eggs up till about 37. Beyond 37, the success rate seems to be lower compared to under 37. And looking at the data that we have over 40, the success rate doesn't appear to be zero, but it's significantly lower than when we're freezing under 35. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Adiola. And um, so if anyone has any questions, you can just pop them into the Q&A. I think there, there is one that popped in there. So this lady said she, she stopped taking the contraception injection and is waiting on her period to return. How will this impact on the process of freezing eggs? So we some investigations can still be done if it's been two months after and the period has not returned. And so, you know, but what could may, we may have to consider is inducing a bleed before we start the cycle if the period has been delayed for a long time. But there are ways to get the period started or get the period to be induced before, you know, proceeding with an egg phase cycle. But if it's been two months, investigations, most of those investigations I mentioned other than the FSAD LH and the estradiol can still be done to have a look at what the egg, um, what the AMH or the egg reserve is. But it may be a consideration where they might have, we might have to consider using medication to induce the bleed to actually start the cycle in some cases. But majority of the people, the period will eventually return. So it shouldn't, except you know, there's other underlying issues, it shouldn't affect the success rate um, overall in terms of the process of egg freeze. Great, thank you. Um, someone's asking will this recording be shared? Yes, um, I'll probably pop it up either tomorrow. Um, yeah, it should be on sometime tomorrow on our YouTube and on our website. And another question here, does egg freezing have any impact on future natural conception? So we do know now that is the, you know, the straight easy answer to that. And that's because of what I mentioned in one of the earlier sites. What happens is that in the regular cycle that month, you have a couple of follicles developing every month, but your body select ones, one, one egg, or sometimes it's two, you end up with twins, but in most cases it's one. And what happens is those are the follicles, they will die that month. So when we're freezing eggs, we don't impact on your reserve. We don't impact on your future reserve. It's only those eggs that are available to us that month that can actually respond to FSH. The eggs that you have in your reserve, they do not have the FSH receptors. So they cannot respond to the medications that we're giving you in that cycle. And that's actually the problem sometimes with egg freeze is that you want to get more eggs, but it's only what's available to us that month. So no matter the dose of the medication we give you, you're only going to have avail what's available to us that month. Okay, it's really interesting. Um, well, if so someone's asking about the waiting time for egg freezing, I suppose, like, first of all, like you'd be starting off with initial consults and in around the wait time for initial consults are around maybe three to four weeks at the moment. Yeah, and, that, that, that's yeah. it. You're right, Ethan. Yeah. 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 It's just and then maybe, after, sorry, yeah, you were going to say something if you finish up. Yeah, no, it was just, and then I suppose after your initial consult, you probably do some investigations and then you'd have to maybe wait for your bleed. And so it's what well, the whole process probably takes about two months, three months, would it be? Yeah. 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 That's what you'll be looking at realistically is about two months, just to give maybe a month of investigation, um, getting appointments and things like that. So realistically about two months and um, should be the average way to start egg phase. Perfect. Um, so someone's asking, are there risks um, to damaging the ovaries during the egg freezing process? 
Yeah, so basically, the, the risk to damaging the ovaries is not actually what we're read, generally concerned mm. about. Your ovaries are quite sturdy. <laughs> mm. um, it's actually the risk to damaging to structures near the ovary. And yes, mm. there are risks. They're not zero, but they're generally quoted about one in 3,000 to one in 5,000 chance of that happening. So I usually say it's probably one of the safest procedure you can have done but there's no procedure without risk. So generally the ovaries are quite sturdy. They will shrink back to their normal size and things like that. But the blood vessels near there, the bowel near there, that's the one that we're quite concerned about. And the risk for that happening is actually about one in 3,000 to about one in 5,000 chance of that happening. I've never seen um, any literature review about an ovary being damaged as egg freeze, more like the complications with the bladder um, or blood mm -hmm. vessels, but they're very rare. Okay. Um, there's some queries there just around kind of um, pricing and things like that. So there, uh, egg freezing would cost 3,000 euro um, for the first stage, but, you know, there might be some extra costs in regards to like just investigations and, um, initial consoles like our, our team will kind of go through all the costs with you beforehand and um, so you, you'll be well aware so there's any queries like that that, that the um, patient coordinators will be able to um, to answer those for you and um, so another one here after a fresh transfer how long do you have to wait to use the frozen egg hmm. um, I'm a little bit concerned about yeah. that uh, confused about that question is the embryo transfer or I'm yeah. thinking maybe she's talking about maybe after the egg collection. Maybe I'm thinking yeah. that. So maybe if or, that's, yeah. yeah. Sorry, after the egg collection, generally, it really depends on how long you want to wait, really depends on you. At present in Ireland, there's no laws with time, time minutes with how long we have to use the eggs. Now that may come into the legislation later on, and I think that it will come eventually. Um, but at this point in time, there's no laws. So it's only a matter of where, you know, if you're having an egg freeze with us, the case, it reviews case by case on a yearly basis, um, whether you want to keep that embryos in storage or not. Um, those eggs, sorry, not embryo, eggs in storage on a yearly basis or not. But I think the oldest eggs are probably used will probably be generally over 10 years old. Um, somebody that had eggs frozen in their, in, you know, in their twenties and we're using it in their thirties. So, um, and that would be on the oncology premise, um, um, on the oncology generally for most people that freezing their eggs socially, they don't wait 10 years to use their eggs. Okay. Um, and so the next one actually, so what's the, the process? So after, um, you after your frozen eggs and you want to have a baby with those frozen eggs, what's the next step then? Exactly. So this is something that I didn't discuss in the slide, but I, can't, I, was, oh, I was hoping somebody might bring that up. So the process of using the eggs really involve what we call an egg freeze thaw process. There are two ways to do that. One is to thaw the eggs. You would then get a sperm from either the partner or donor. We fertilize those eggs that we have in storage, and then we form embryos. And the embryos then is in the incubator for five to six days. And we can either freeze those embryos completely, all of them, and you decide when you want to start using them, or we can proceed to prepare your lining at the same time that we're preparing the embryo, the eggs to fertilize and then put one embryo back and then freeze the rest. It really depends on the person. Um, it depends on the timing of the cycle as well. So oftentimes we find it's easier to, you know, thaw all the eggs, fertilize, see how many eggs you get that survive the procedure. And one thing I forgot to mention is the success rate for survivors about 80 to 85% when we're thawing the eggs to use. And that process then is fertilized and form the embryo and freeze the embryos at the end. And that's usually the most common way because it's easier to plan that. And also we don't run into a situation where we prepare your lining and ready for transfer, but there's no embryo to put back. So there are two different ways to do that. 
but essentially the eggs will be thawed or warmed up. Um, and that process usually take a couple of hours. And then what will happen is eggs that have been frozen can only undergo ICSI procedure. So the sperm will be injected directly with the, into the eggs that have been thawed after they've survived. And the next day after we check for fertilization, grow the embryos in the incubator over five to six days. And like I said, in most cases, we freeze all the embryos and start preparing the lining to put those embryos back. Perfect. Um, another question about, um, so typically do women experience many side effects due to medications? You said? If Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so you, sorry, it was just a question about side effects around medication. Yes. So uh, one of the main things that um, we have we have to talk about is side effects would be individual because everybody is different. But the most common one is bloating and constipation. So they always get big. Like I said, we're producing maybe one or two follicles every month. Now we're trying to get eight to 15 or maybe more of those developed that month. So the most common side effect is I feel I'm bloated, I feel like I'm pregnant, I'm retaining a little bit of fluid. That's the most common side effect. Generally, most of those side effects will improve once we do the air collection because we reduce the hormone levels and things like that. Um, some people have sensitivities to hormone. So if you're the type that tends to have maybe PMS symptoms and you have a little bit of mood issues and things like that, that can also happen. But oftentimes, actually, the when it comes to the mood, majority of the patients that have that actually have it after the egg collection when the hormone levels drop down and they feel like they're getting a withdrawal effect from the hormone. And then they may then complain about, you know, I just feel a little bit low, a, a little bit down. But we do have patient support during a cycle um, for treatment for anybody during that time if they need somebody to talk to. But those are the biggest side effect is bloating and constipation. Um, generally for the injection itself is mainly discomfort. People don't feel more than that. And, you know, in terms of any big side effect other than that, it's ovarian hyperstimulation, but generally we do not use HCG for trigger anymore. And the risk of that condition now with the trigger we use is 0.01%. So that's the biggest side effect we worry about, but you can almost eliminate that to almost 0% in that case. Um, so this is a kind of a question, I suppose it's, it's pretty much probably more age related. So like, what's the rate percentage of how many eggs will fertilize and then how many will then make it to blastocyst after that? It's very, this is where it's yeah. very, very difficult. So yeah. we don't have a lot of data to, to say exactly. What we usually say is if you're even maybe up to about you know, 36, maybe 37, at least you want to have 28 in storage. That's what we advise generally. And that's because if they're saying maybe 15, maybe some people will need less, some people will need more, and that will give us more numbers. Now, the studies that I've looked at this, which is the Anacobo studies, is mainly for cancer patient. And what they, what they found from this is that 80% of the eggs will survive. So if you have 10, you, do, you drop down to eight, eight, you know, eight eggs. Then if those fertilize, and this is, we're talking of people less than 35, what then you would expect from that is to get on average one to three blastocysts. And each of those embryo will probably give us anywhere between about 30 to maybe 40 plus percent chance of success. But it's very difficult to relate that to people doing social equities because we don't have a big data. So what I usually say is because most people don't use their eggs till later on, it's the more eggs you have, the better because in storage. And that means sometimes maybe having to do multiple cycles of the egg freeze to get the numbers to get to 20. 
outside of 37, we don't have a good data of how many number of eggs you actually name. This is where the problem lies. And this North American study is even saying if you're 42 or more, you probably should be looking at 50 plus eggs. So it kind of makes it very difficult to say exactly how many blasts, but generally, if you're getting that kind of, you know, you're less than, th you're 35 or less, and you're getting that 15 eggs, we should be able to have maybe anywhere to one to three, maybe even four blastoses from that cycle. Each of those blastoses giving us about 30 to 40% chance of success. Perfect. Um, so then someone's just asking how many, so how many ultra scans will be required during your, say during your uh, egg freezing cycle? Everybody will be different, but it varies on average between maybe three to five. So there will be a baseline scan done at kind of the beginning of the cycle. What then happens in the next visit after that, we vary between day five to day eight, depending on your history. So for example, somebody with lower reserve or hybrid reserve might come back later, whereas somebody that have a shorter cycle and lower reserve may come earlier. So that makes it sometimes, some people have maybe additional scans from that. But on a standard basis, you should be looking at about maybe three to five on average before you get there. So one at baseline, another one about seven to eight days after starting stimulation, and then a scan between maybe two days after that, day nine, day 10, and another one maybe day 11, day 12, something like that would be what you'd be expecting on that. So about so if you're the person that you're ready on day 10, you only need maybe three scans. If you're somebody that you're ready on day 12, you will need three, uh, three additional scans on top of your baseline, which is four, and if you're later ready, then you may have to have more visits like that. But on average, it would be anywhere between about three to five. So one at baseline, at a minimum, generally two um, scans later on um, in the other half of your cycle. And, and that's generally the way it's done in terms of the number of scans. Yeah. yeah. And, and just to add to that, just in regards to scans, like if you are, if it's a location, you know, we, we do have the satellite clinics, like I mentioned. So if you do need, if, the, if those satellite clinics are closer to you during your cycle, you can actually get your scans done there. You don't have to come. You'll have to get your, you know, your um, egg collection done in like the likes of Swords or Klonsky or, or, or Cork. Um, but, you, you know, you can get your scans done there in, in the satellite clinics um, if that's easier for you as well. Um, then there was just, I think there was a question around, there's a few um, quite specific questions that kind of came through that if you want to send them on to myself afterwards and we, we can kind of, um, we can answer them afterwards. It's just, I'm conscious of time as well. And like just some of those wouldn't really be able to be answered over this form, but you know, if, feel free to send them on to communications at thins.ie, that's, that's no problem. We will get those answered for you. Um, but I think there was a question around um, how are eggs graded? And I know there's embryo grading, but are eggs graded in the same way? No, no, we don't. Generally, um, the, the reason embryos are graded the way they're graded is they have many cells. This is a problem with eggs compared to embryos. So an embryo has a capacity to repair itself because it has loads of eggs. You know, in terms of, if you think about it, not the one egg, but it has multiple cells. You, the egg is one cell, one union, you, you know, one cell on its own. So the problem we have with that, if there's an insult on the egg, there's nothing much you can do about it. So what they look at is what, how it looks. Does that make sense? Does it look like it's breaking down and it's not quite great quality or does it look, the cell looks very dark, but there's no real grading for eggs like you have embryos because it doesn't have that area where it's the inner cell, the outer cell. So the blastocyst is at least 100 cells, whereas your egg has only one cell. And that's the reason why you can't have that same type of grading. But, and that's also the reason why it's difficult to really grade the quality of eggs. Okay, I'm sorry, she said she meant actually the grading on embryos. So how are embryos graded? Oh, embryo, our oh, embryo is graded, sorry. In terms yeah. of embryo, when we're looking at embryo, they're graded generally from blastocyst stage. I'm talking about blastocyst now. They give grade three to about five, 
based on how much the cell is filling the shell of the egg. So what happens is that you have the shell, fertilization happens and this, egg, this cell start dividing. So we usually have what we call very early blastocysts. Sometimes they call it B1. But once we form a blastocyst, a proper blastocyst that have the part that has the embryo and the outside that forms the placenta, we call it trophoectoderm, and then the inner cell mass forms the baby. So the grade three to grade five is given to how much is feeling and ready to get out of the shell. So a blastocyst fills the shell, but doesn't fill it completely. An expanded blastocyst, which is the four, fills in the shell almost fully and about to get out of the shell. And the grade five is given to action blastocyst that is ready to get out of the shell. And then sometimes people call six, which is when it's completely out of the shell completely, but generally it's about three to five. And that's just talking about how the cells are in comp comparison to filling up the wall of the shell and ready to get out. So those are the grade three to five. Then what happens is they then grade the inner cell, the ones that form the placenta, A, B, and C. So the more the cells are together and pretty looking, it looks, it looks grade B. When the cells are a little bit apart, it's giving grade B, and the more broken down the cells, and sometimes even the embryo may not have the inner part that forms the baby at all, that will still be given grade C. The same goes for the trophoectoderm. The more compact, the more together they are, the less they look broken down, they're given A, B, or C. So oftentimes what you might hear people say is, I have a three A embryo. That means the cells are together, it looks very pretty, but the embryo hasn't completely filled in the wall of the shell yet. Or they may have grade four A, B, but they always grade the inner cell before the outer cell mass and just generally how the embryos are grading. And that's the most common grading method. There are other older grading methods, but this is kind of the generally more acceptable one. Perfect. Um, and then there's just one, why um, do success rates decrease with age? You said, why age? Why do success rates decrease with age? Yeah, so that was kind of in my initial slide, mm -hmm. but the fact that I was explaining that the amount of our embryos that genetically normal, the percentage of that is, oh, it's kind of goes higher as we get older. And I was saying that when we're in maybe up to about 30, they say maybe 66% um, are genetically normal. And when you get to over 42, it's actually the other way around 78% are genetically abnormal. And that's because those spindle fibers has been keeping an embryo, yeah, since we're in embryos, since we're inside the baby, those spindle fibers has been stuck and has been there for a long time. So if you, the, the best way to explain it, if you have a piece of rope and you're not, you know, the older you're using the rope, eventually start breaking into bits or start tearing apart. And that's eventually what happens. They start breaking into pieces and then we have more abnormal division. And that's the reason for the success rate being lower is actually mainly to do with the quality of the eggs that we're getting as we get older, they're more likely to have abnormal division. Okay, um, that's perfect. So I think that's the majority of questions answered. Um, so, I think, like I said, if there's anyone who has any further questions, just um, I put up that email there. So communications at sims.ie. So if you have any questions, pop it through and, and we'll get them answered for you. So I just wanted to say thank you so much to everyone who came out um, this evening. I hope you found it informative. I hope you enjoyed some aspect of it. And thank you so much to Dr. Adiola for your time and um, some amazing information there. I've, I've learned loads myself. So um, thank you so much and um, have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.